Welcome to Faith Talks, a monthly program on the The Generation podcast designed to help young ladies discover greater ways to nurture and exercise their faith in their day-to-day walk with Christ. Hello, I'm Jana Faith. And I'm Anna Faith, and welcome to episode 11 of Faith Talks. So this year we are going to start out with a new theme focusing on stories. I don't know about you guys, but everybody loves a good story. And these stories are going to be coming from women who have gone through a lot of trials in their lives and just chosen to trust God and have faith despite their circumstances. Also, we'll look at stories from women of the Bible and how they chose faith and even just relate that together with the women that we interview and women from the Bible that they love and that have impacted their lives. And I don't know about you, sometimes when you're reading the Bible, you read about a woman and you're like, wow, that's, I've totally been there. I know exactly what she's feeling. Mm -hmm. And just kind of relating those to get together in that the women of the Bible aren't really a whole lot different than we were. You know, they had trials and faced a lot of the same things we have. So today I'm excited. We're going to dive right into sharing an amazing story from, we have here with us, Greta Bolin. And today's a special day for her. We should sing a happy birthday to her. It's her two-year anniversary of being saved, January 15th. That's so exciting. Let's see, it was 2020? 2020. So two years ago. So we're excited. We decided to do it on the actual day, two years ago, that she got saved. So Greta, would you just tell us a little bit about yourself, what you like to do, who you are? Well, my name is Greta Bolin, and I am a wife and mother of one son, and he's 13, and taking care of him is a full-time job in itself. (laughs) (laughs) But I also have a full-time job. I work in customer service at RJ Schinner Company, and in my free time, I do have some free time, (laughs) I like to do my devotions and study my Bible and color and sometimes do crafts and puzzles and she's an amazing cook and I love to cook I have experienced this on multiple (laughs) occasions so I speak for her (laughs) so I guess we'll get started with your story then so Greta why don't you just tell us a little bit about your childhood and your home life okay I was born into a family of both of my parents were alcoholics, so our home was plagued with that issue. And they were both in bondage to that addiction. And most nights my dad wasn't home. He was out at the bar. And on weekends, my mom would go with him. And I felt very alone and very abandoned. Um, Weeknights, though, it was almost harder when my mom was home because she wanted to be with my dad and she was angry at him for being out. And so she would take it out. She would yell and scream at us kids. And I felt like it was all my fault. And if there was something different about me, then they would want to be home. And if I didn't exist, then my mom could be happy and be without my dad or out with my dad. And I just wanted love and peace. So how did you cope with those feelings? What did you do? Well, when I couldn't stand it anymore, I would run to my room and I would throw violent tantrums. I would pick up pillows, books, anything that wasn't nailed down, and I would hurl them against the walls, into the floor, and break anything I could. And then as I got older, when I would calm down, I would find a razor blade and I would punish myself. And as the blood would form and flow out of my body, I felt a momentary release from my chaotic life. And I also did burning. Um, I would smoke and then I would put my cigarettes out on my arm. And even though it was painful, it was nothing compared to how I felt inside. And I, I had so much anger and resentment towards my parents. Why... Why wasn't I enough? Why couldn't they love me? I felt very abandoned. I think that's so characteristic of bitterness, too. Like, it it destroys you from the inside out, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. 
And Christmas Eve, when I was about 10 years old, was the first time that I personally tasted alcohol. My mom was upset at my dad, and he was sick and not up with us. And so she gave my sister and I some wine. And I I don't know now, thinking back, why she thought that was going to be fun for us. Because I spent the entire night throwing up. I got really sick. And then I didn't touch alcohol for a few years. And then I went to college, and it became a very easy way to cope with my life and my insecurities and the feelings of abandonment that I just never got over. Um, But before that, when I was 17, my parents let my boyfriend move in with us. And they were completely indifferent to my sinful life, and they literally didn't care what I did and some kids might have called that freedom but it was just adding to the bondage that I was in. When I got to college I hung around the party crowd. If someone knew how to have fun for a night that's who I was with. Between the age of 20 and 30 I tried committing suicide more times than I can even count. However every time no matter how hard I tried and schemed I would fail. I used to cry out, you know, why? I can't even do this right. And then in my early 30s, I was engaged to be married. And then six months before our wedding, my fiance was diagnosed with a brain tumor. Mm -hmm. And then about four weeks after that, he was diagnosed with Burkett's lymphoma. And we were told he had six months to live. And did you have thoughts of maybe just let's break up the relationship and not bother staying with him or just not getting married but maybe still being friends? Or It never crossed my mind, actually. Mm-hmm. I couldn't, the thought of him, he didn't believe in God and the thought of him dying alone without love and his family wasn't very supportive. I I just stayed with him. We decided to go ahead with the marriage, and he died about eight months after we got married, and once again, I was alone. I continued to drink and party frequently just to fill the void in my heart and my life, and sometimes I would party near my apartment. Other times, I would go further away, and it was one of those times that I met Tom, but our relationship was based on our common pastime, partying. Mm -hmm. And so we would go out drinking together, and as the months progressed, um, we talked about getting married in the fall of 2008, and as the wedding drew closer, I began to have second thoughts. Is it really what I wanted to do with my life? Party every night? Maybe we should break up? I should do something else? And all my thoughts were interrupted when I found myself staring at a test in shock. I was pregnant. I told Tom, and he was not very happy. (laughs) He was angry, and he yelled at me, well, now we have to get married. (laughs) I, I I was excited. All I had ever wanted to be was a mom. That's what I dreamed of, you know, some kids want to be a fireman or... I wanted to be a mom. (laughs) So I was pretty excited. Um, We got married, and although our lives were supposed to join, they did nothing of the sort. Tom continued to party, and I wanted nothing to do with that life anymore because I had another life growing inside of me, and this little life was depending on me. And I had to reform for the sake of my precious baby. That would soon arrive... And as each month progressed, I turned into thinking about being a mom and looking like a mom really (laughs) quick. (laughs) Now, tell us about your baby. Um, Did you have like a first ultrasound that kind of stood out or when you, what was your first appointment? (laughs) Oh, my first appointment. Well, I remember going for my first ultrasound. I was super excited. I was trembling and the doctor came into the room and as he spoke, I I couldn't believe his words. Um, My mom, my dad, Tom was there, and he said, Ma'am, your baby is not okay. 
We cannot find all of his internal organs. And I will never forget in my mind how he said, you need to consider other options. Hmm. And my mind was swirling. And I said right away, you know, no, this is not your decision to make. God put him in me. And God is the only one that can take him away from me. And the doctor shrugged and left. A week later, I was back for a second ultrasound. And this time they found that my baby had two club feet and a hole in his heart, but at least they found all of his organs. And the weeks passed and August came and they put me on bed rest. It was not an easy pregnancy. And I wanted to have him at Community Memorial and I was at Freightert. And so I finally got up the courage to ask the doctor, you know, can I be transferred? And he said, you can go home on Friday, but be at Community Memorial Monday because he's gonna, we're going to C-section him at okay. noon. And so, you know, we we're all excited. And Tom was like, on Sunday night, we'll go out to dinner, our last night as a couple. And while well, the Brewers were in the playoffs, and so he went out to the bar and he didn't come home for dinner and said he was gambling. And as he didn't come home, I looked at our bank account and I noticed that the money was going out faster than, yeah, it was. And so I was very shocked and he had spent almost everything we had. And being a short woman of five feet at this point, I was nearly as far wide as I was tall. <laughs> but this didn't stop me. I took my big, big pregnant self and I marched down to the bar and I confronted him. And I said, give me that card. And, you know, we're having a kid tomorrow. How can you spend all of our money? And he wasn't too happy. And I just grabbed it and I marched my big pregnant <laughs> self right back right home. Back. <laughs> so then the next day, did you go in? Was Tom sober by that time? or? Yes. Okay. Yep. I found myself numbed and ready for the birth of my precious baby. I insisted on being awake. And as they pulled Trey out, the nurse turned to me and said, Oh, Mama, you're going to have your hands full. And the doctor was like, Normally I just pull them out. But he was climbing out. He was pushing his way through my stomach, arms and legs flying. Little did I know that this would be much, <laughs> much very characteristic <laughs> of my little boy's life. But the birth went smoothly. And then after that, just a very short time after he was born, things started to go downhill very fast. He couldn't suck or swallow. Um, his body wasn't producing, like his pancreas wasn't working. And so they had to take him into the NICU. He had a feeding tube and it was, he was there for 21 days. And then at six months old, he started having surgeries for his feet. That's how old he had to be to take anesthesia. Now, like knowing that he had all these physical problems, did you ever think anything was like internal? Or did you see were... that as a mom? Mm -hmm. I, I had a feeling. Um, but having him as my first child and just being so starstruck. I don't know. Yeah, I was starstruck at having this little life and a baby, you know, being everything I'd always wanted to be. And then I was talking to his physical therapist one day and she said, you know, things, it's not just the outside. I think things are going on inside as well. And I, I knew she was right. And she said I needed to get him evaluated. And so I stared at my then two-year-old boy, and I just, I knew she was right. I had been noticing stuff for a while, and you just And at this and point, he didn't talk, right? He was not right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he didn't walk or talk, and he didn't eat anything except yogurt. That's right, and saltines, right? Yep, yogurt and saltines. <laughs> <laughs> and so I knew, but you don't want to think about that, and... So I said to Tom that, you know, we were, I wanted to get him evaluated mm -hmm. and he was in complete denial. He was angry. He said, there's no child of mine that is defective. 
And as I watched Trey struggle, I, I knew I had to do something. And so I went behind Tom's back, scheduled an appointment, and sure enough, Trey was diagnosed that he needed every kind of therapy they offered, speech, occupational, food, everything. And then during that time, did you guys attend church anywhere? We did. We were faithful Catholics. And I taught catechism for special ed kids, and I taught catechism for parents. And I was content to listen to what they told me to believe, um, but... Tom and Trey, not so much. (laughs) Every Sunday, Tom would complain about the priest's political speeches to convince his flock to vote Democrat, and Trey would whisper to me, Mommy, why does the priest only talk about himself? Isn't the church supposed to be about Jesus? (laughs) And we stayed in the church because we, we didn't know any different. Honestly, we kind of fit in. You know, we were the typical dysfunctional Catholic family, drunk, angry people during the week and filling a pew on Sunday. I prayed a lot, and I thought I had a close relationship with God, um, but it, it was based on works. And I first started to notice my religion was off when I started to read the Bible. I noticed that God was working in my life, Um. And so I wanted to learn more about it. And so I started, you know, you just pick up a Bible, start at the beginning. And I remember asking myself, you know, why don't we follow these rules that are, you know, here? Because you were in the Old Testament. (laughs) Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. And I was like, well, maybe if we started doing this. (laughs) So was it right around this time where Trey started becoming, like, interested in taking music lessons? Or was it a little bit after It was a little bit after. Um, Trey wanted a piano. He loved his uh, music teacher at school, and I think it was Christmas of 2017, he decided he wanted a piano. And when he gets his mind stuck on something, (laughs) it's happening. (laughs) It is. It's happening. (laughs) And so we started looking for a piano teacher. We went to Casio and their special ed music teacher was she was not patient and the way she taught Trey was she was mean and after one lesson we were like nope thanks you know thanks for the book bye (laughs) and I prayed and I prayed and prayed and prayed and I called several places to find another teacher and no one could help me. I would explain the situation and they would just kind of, you know, put me off. And every, you know, like Trey's de- uh, child development clinic is on North Avenue. And so we would drive down North Avenue quite a bit. And I was thinking that, okay, I'll call the Steinway place. But that's not where I called. (laughs) I ended up calling White House with Music on accident. And I explained my situation again that I needed, you know, a teacher for Trey, somebody patient and loving, but someone that could not be manipulated because he's really good at (laughs) controlling the conversation. And so it's, I knew it would be hard to come by, but he said, I have the person. I have the teacher for you. I know exactly. (laughs) But I don't know if she has any openings. And so he's like, I'll get back to you. (laughs) And I remember the day. So my boss texted me and he's like, we have a student for you. And it's another special ed situation. But I know you don't have any openings. And I know you're really busy. But would you consider opening something up? And a few days later, he called me back. And... Miss Jana said that she would open another slot for us at noon on Saturdays, and it could have been three in the morning, and I would have taken it. I wish there were more students like that. (laughs) But working with scheduling, you're like about to rip your hair out sometimes. Oh, we were were not picky. We were excited. Mm -hmm. And from the moment we met Miss Jana, it was, I mean, we were captivated. It was... I don't want to sound like weird and say it was love at first sight, but there was just something <laughs> about her. And um, she had a light and you know, it was it was weird. I 
looked in shock as Tom started like coming with us to Trey's lessons, offering to take him, you know, and sit in there. And he never like participated willingly like that. And, you know, he didn't even take Trey to school or doctor's appointments. That was always, you know, just mommy's thing. And that's just the way it was. And so piano lessons were different and I'm good. (laughs) And music was really hard for Trey, but he loved that challenge and the adventure of it. And we had so much fun watching him learn and flourish. And it was like our favorite, you know, time of the week. That was. (laughs) And we had, we had a lot of fun. That was where the the Bear family was birthed. Yes! <laughs> so I don't know if <laughs> your listeners might think we're crazy, but for rhythms here, we teach them with a Bear family. So you clap different rhythms with Papa Bear and Mama Bear and Baby Bear. So of course, with the whole family in, squished in that little room at White House, Papa Bear was the Papa Bear, and we would give him the Papa Bear stuff, and Mama Bear and then Baby Bear. And Trey just fell in love with that. So now, to this day... He still calls Papa Bear. I'm Sister Bear. Yep. He has Mom, Mama Bear, Baby Bear. My dad is Dr. Bear. Dr. Jim, Dr. Bear. That works yep. out. So, but I remember just meeting them at first, just loving their family and just falling in love with them. And I remember going home after the first day and I'm like, that's not at all what I thought it would be. <laughs> like, I was just <laughs> impressed with how he was doing and everything. And we had a blast. Those different weeks but right from the start I noticed that they probably weren't saved I remember I asked you guys where you went to church and you mm-hmm. told me oh we go to such and such catholic church um and then I also remember Trey would use a lot of wrong language and you would always <laughs> yell at him like stop stop <laughs> or and he would be like oh but he it, you could tell he didn't even barely know what he was saying it was just what he heard at school you know mm-hmm. repeating it but he would use them all the time and yes. I think that's one of been one of the really blessings to see him change, and like now I just you, you don't hear that at all. Like he no. just doesn't doesn't even think about saying it. Um, but I remember I started to really pray for them that God would give me an opportunity to be able to share the gospel, or be a light more to them. And um, just through a couple different weeks watching their family and observing different things, I remember one particular time after I taught them on Saturdays. And a couple other people, I went in my car and I was just praying for them as I drove home, just for their family and for their salvation. And I remember the Lord just absolutely broke me that they had to get saved and that it was, it was more than just, it was like God gave me a little glimpse of what he wanted to do in their family. And I just remember I started crying and I just sobbed all the way home, just praying for the Bolin family. And I remember I even mentioned something to my parents later, just, you know, I I think they're going to get saved. Like, I I think God's going to do this. And at that time, it was the farthest thing from what was happening. But God gave me that confidence, like, no, he's going to do it. He's going to save them. And it came time for our Christmas program. And so I gathered up an invite and went and invited them. And they were excited. (laughs) What did you think when you got that flyer? (laughs) Oh, we were super excited. And Trey was just, I mean, he had to see his Jana. And we we were so excited to go. And so we actually got home from the lesson. And, I mean, I didn't even, like, set my stuff down. And so I'm calling the number and <laughs> I'm trying to register. And they were like, what are you talking about? <laughs> That's not even open yet. And so, but they took my name and everything. They were really gracious and registered us. Probably when they got around to it because, well, actually, I did call and say, are you sure you got it? <laughs> Double check. Make sure yes. you guys. I mean, for the record, they were in the second row, so they did get good seats. Yes, we did. We That's got very true. good seats. So what did you think when you showed up? What were your first thoughts? Well, we, we walked in, and, like, we walked into church, and Tom looked at me, and he said, it feels really weird here. It feels like. Like we're home, and I nodded and I said, "You know, it's it's amazing." And he said, "Everyone here is like Jana. Do you think it's a cult?" <laughs> and I said, "Maybe." That's, that is the best phrase. <laughs> I said, "Maybe," but I don't want to leave. 
and he didn't either, and Trey was obviously just beside himself. <laughs> and the program was incredible. <laughs> I remember, actually, the first time you came, Jana had told us about you coming, and she's like, you got to meet this family. And I remember meeting Trey, and then I remember seeing him during the concert, like, stand oh, up yes. and start oh, direct yes. conducting. He loves to conduct. He does. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember you that first time that you came. Now, what did you think, as unsaved folks at that point, what did you think of the message? Well, I was I was worried how Tom would respond, um, but he seemed to be listening. And then during the message, Trey turned to me and said, Mommy, listen, he's talking about Jesus. And so at the end of the message, the pastor asked if anyone would like a packet with more information about accepting the Lord as their Savior and three bear paws shot right up. <laughs> and after the program, Tom said, that was amazing. And Trey announced... I'm coming here. Do they have Sunday school? When is church? <laughs> and just like his piano, when he sets his mind to something. <laughs> He's all in. Yep. Mm -hmm. And as we filed out of the second row, I I just knew we'd be back. And did you think at that point, like, we'll still go back to our Catholic church? Or were you just like, I'm coming here? No, I, I seriously thought, okay, I have my obligations there. You know, I have these things that I am mm -hmm. supposed to do, you know, my teaching and everything. And so I thought, okay, you know, we'll do every other. We'll bring Trey to Sunday school and, you know, we'll one of us will come every other and we'll just work it out that, you know, we can do both. Um, and then we went back to our Catholic church the next Sunday with this plan all in place, and that was the last time we were ever there. And then I guess we'll move along to the follow-up visit. So I remember <laughs> we were trying to line up follow-up visits, and there were several families that had come that we were trying to visit. And so I was like, Mom and Dad, you have to get you have to get the Bolin family and go visit them. So I got the paper, or maybe my dad did, I can't remember, and we got the paper, and they went for the follow-up visit that first time. So Fast forward to you. <laughs> what did you think when you heard that random knocking after a couple weeks? Of so it was at night, Monday night, and it was cold and it was winter, and Trey and I were just like scampering around the living room, throwing Christmas wrapping paper, and you know, just I was trying to get him ready for bed, <laughs> and so it was just Christmas chaos and then we heard a knock at the door and we were both like super startled and we both froze and he like looked at me and he's like should I answer it and so he went and he like peeked out the window next to the door and he's like it's Jana's mom and dad should I let them in <laughs> I said of course <laughs> and it was a wonderful visit and Mrs. Van Gelderen did a salvation drawing for Trey Tom was asleep and so it was just Trey and I. And they decided they would come back when we could all be together as a family. And But it, it was a wonderful, wonderful time talking. And as they left that night, I just knew in my heart that our lives were never going to be the same. And then I remember they came home and told us at Family Devotions that night just what had happened. Um, and my mom's so smooth that way. She's like, the family needs to hear the gospel. So then she'll say, oh, can I show your small child a gospel drawing? And, like, show it huge so the whole family can see. <laughs> She's great at that. <laughs> yes, she but, is. But then I remember they were talking about they were going to head out on their tour, so they need to, they wanted to visit you guys that second time. So there was some reason none of us girls were able to go. So they brought Silas with them, and they showed up for that second visit. Yes. And so... They brought Silas, and so he could be with Trey. And so then we got to sit, sit down with the Van Gelderens and talk. And as Dr. Jim started talking to Tom, I was just truly amazed with how open Tom was. Being a Catholic, he never like went directly to God and never had a close relationship with him. But as they talked, Tom was agreeing and... You know, I had always thought that in order for someone to, you know, gain salvation, they had to do some measure of good works. And 
as I read a sheet of verses from Mrs. Van Gelderen, I realized that the Bible clearly taught, you know, exactly what they were telling us, that salvation is through faith alone. And after reading the sheet, I looked up at the Van Gelderens and I said, it's pretty clear that it's not by works. <laughs> and at the end of the presentation, Tom and I both bowed our heads and asked Jesus to save us. And this might sound like a good end to my story, but it truly was only the beginning. From that moment on, I learned how life really is and how to really live. And the Bible became my instruction manual and how I loved, love to talk to my new friend. And I remember getting a, getting a text from my parents <laughs> I was in downstairs in youth workers meeting on Wednesday night and I remember getting a text the Bolins both got saved and I'm like wait what <laughs> so I like I just like Mr. Raines was talking and everybody was sitting there listening and I was just like oh my word that is so exciting I like literally started yelling and everyone was looking at me like what are you even thinking Mr. Raines is like Jana are you okay and I'm like the Bolins <laughs> just got saved <laughs> so that was an exciting day <laughs> was <laughs> <laughs> now so after you got saved then you started coming to falls right away then yes yes and it's funny because for the christmas spectacular we sat in the second row those first three seats mm -hmm. and for the christmas carol we sat in that second row those first three seats and every sunday <laughs> there we are and Wednesday and every other activity were in those first three seats. And we joined pastor's class right away. And as he discussed the history of the Baptists and the reasons behind why they believe what they did, I saw God clearly change Tom. With deep conviction, he exclaimed to me, I was lied to my entire life. And he has this anger in his heart knowing that he was being led by hypocrites and didn't know the truth and now he knows the truth for himself and he was adamant and excited and it was just amazing to see him passionate about I remember God. him several times sharing that even just at different discipleships how that was one thing that really bothered him when he was at the other church just and I think it kind of parallels to the um, political parties. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. But just yeah. not being told the truth was mm -hmm. a huge theme in his life. Yes. And then Trey got saved a couple... Was February it the next, 28th? The next month. I'm sure I'll hear about it on February 28th. Oh, yes, you will. He <laughs> will tell me. <laughs> should probably send a birthday greeting. Yes. <laughs> So that was in 2020, January, correct? Yes. So then right after that is when COVID started, and how did that affect your family? Well, as the tragedy rocked the world, it helped our little family. It turned out to be a very strange blessing. It took us out of the world, away from people, away from Satan's traps, took Trey out of a public school, which was a horrible influence, <laughs> And it allowed our little baby Christian family to grow and prepare for when we would be forced to return to the world. Um, as a child and young adult, I always wanted freedom. And I always wanted peace. I always wanted to go home. And I, I could never figure out why I wanted to go home. Wasn't I home? But now I realize that all of those are Jesus. And it is he who has changed our family. In our lives and I know that some of you ladies listening might look at the world with desire or envy or think that's exciting and shiny and sparkly but I can tell you what it's like because I came from it I was there it's it's painful it's very painful you there's no love there's no peace it only destroys you from both the outside and the inside. You know, be content where you are because you're lucky to have, you know, a, a godly family. Be grateful for that because not everyone is that blessed. And if you have a hole in your life, that hole in your life 
is Jesus shaped and he's the only one that can fill it. Hmm. That's really good. Um, just going back to, we just had our spiritual awakening conference and one of the messages, um, pastor Ingram talked about worldliness and how that affects our lives so much. And that was really impactful to me. And even just realizing how much I still look to the world and kind of let the world influence my life and even just hearing your story and just how empty the world is and how you know you didn't choose where like your home that you grew up in but that was just full of the world and it was so hard for you and just to see how the world is so empty and it is so destructive and I I think that's really really important to just realize as Christians and as you know, I've grown up in a Christian home, Jana has, and to just be so thankful for what we've been given and to just um, not look at the world at all with any, you know, um, just wanting to be satisfied by it at all, but to realize that Jesus is the only thing that gives us true fulfillment, true peace. And so that's really, mm-hmm. really good. I feel like yes. it's easy to want to be or just end up being influenced by the world just through Mm. media or even just being around you know but just to realize that we do have that truth that one way and Mm -hmm. to be thankful for that now could you tell us just a little bit about how your life is different now that you're saved what has changed this is the happy part we spent like the whole (laughs) podcast (laughs) on the sad part (laughs) oh it it's it's changed profoundly um it's the excite you know it's exciting to see how how Tom has changed and how he's finally finding peace and just coming to terms with so many things in his past that he could never deal with and that you know it's it's taking him a while but you know he goes he goes to the word you know he's there's bibles laying all around our house you know just in case you need one right there it's you know it's there we all have our favorites but um, got that easy read yes (laughs) but it's you know the truth there's that solid foundation you know when you're in the world you're just like floating there's no nothing solid it's just a constant you know what next and you know being saved you have that foundation you have the you know the end all be all of life this is what it's about this is our purpose Uh, you know there's no questions and that must be amazing too just to see how you know you remember Tom when he would come back from the bar you know and just like the complete change what Jesus has done in his life that's amazing it is and Trey I can't even I will be driving down the road and, you know, he'll be rolling up his window or, you know, rolling up his window saying, that's not godly. <laughs> it's just neat yeah, how okay, he has. You've got to tell them the restaurant story where he went. Okay, now I'm forgetting. Oh. Exactly was, where he went and talked to the people. Because yes. they were cursing. That's right. They were yes. cursing. Yes. There was. <laughs> this is coming from Trey who normally did. Yes, we were sitting in a local restaurant eating one day and there was a table of and it was like older individuals and they were casually cursing and taking the Lord's name in vain and he was sitting there and he was just shaking his head and he started slamming down his french fries and I'm looking at him just curious what he was going to do and he's like I can't take it so he gets up and he goes over to the table and he's like, excuse me, which one of you took the Lord's name in vain just now? And <laughs> there was a guy and a lady and they both pointed at the other lady and she's like, what? I didn't. <laughs> and he just went off on them saying, you know, it's, you know, you're taking the Lord's name in vain. You're disrespecting Jesus. And he just went to town and, you know, I... Part of me was like, you know, horrified, you know, not that he was doing that, but, you know, just like, oh, and then the rest of me was like, go Trey, you know, and so Tom and I just sat there chuckling 
And, you know, after he had had his moment and they were quiet, he came back. And <laughs> I bet she has not forgotten that, though. She probably hasn't. Now let's move on to our Woman of the Bible focus now. You were reading the Bible as an adult, so you maybe were hearing some of the stories or reading them for the first time. Was there a character that stuck out to you? It was definitely Esther. Oh, and I love Esther. I love Esther. And I think it was Esther because of her simple acts of obedience. And just, you know, she was just, she just did what she knew was right. And it was like God's providence. You know, she just was abandoned as a child, mm -hmm. you know, and then she just went along with whatever God put in her path and embraced it and took it and didn't worry about, you know, herself. Like when it came to, you know, going to the king yes. for her people and she knew that she could end up, you know, dead from going to the king. She didn't think about that. She didn't think about what would happen to her. She just wanted to do the right thing for Jesus and or for God. I think that one word that sticks out to me is the same one, the providence. Mm -hmm. Just seeing how God guided you from your even early age all the way to where you are now and just seeing how God guided Esther, you know, his unseen hand just throughout that whole book, just guiding and directing everything. And you know, you both have had to trust that God had a plan, even though you couldn't see it. Mm -hmm. You know, you might, if you looked right in the story, like if I was living your life with you, it might seem like, why are all these things happening? Yes. But even the pregnancy and Trey and everything was what led you to the Lord. And mm -hmm. I think that's so, that's so neat that trials can often lead us to freedom, you mm -hmm. know, and even that desperation of you crying out for even just praying about a piano teacher or praying about for the truth, you were definitely seeking. Yes, and, just and he was answering. He was steps. there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tom and I were talking this morning, looking back, just how everything happened. You know, you can see his hand all throughout, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. our lives together, even yeah. from the yucky part to now. God's hand was in it. Mm -hmm. That's really true. And I think another theme, just hearing your story, is that as you sought the truth, you just took that simple step of obedience and you know each of us have our own story each of you girls listening have your own story and if we can just you know see that next little step that God wants us to take and trust him and take that step then we're gonna find ourselves in the end being where we want to be even though at the at the moment we don't see that end result like Gina was saying mm -hmm. But as we just see what God has for us, we can just simply take that next step of simple obedience to God and just be so thankful for where he has brought us. And from the sin, even if you girls have come from broken homes, just thank God so much for what he has done in your life and how he's going to continue to grow your faith and your trust in him. So I just encourage each one of you, as you see that next step, whatever that may be, to just choose faith in each situation. And remember, faith doesn't just talk, faith walks. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the The Generation Podcast. If you're serious about living a life of total surrender and total dependence, please consider signing the The Generation Pledge. It's not a promise of perfection, but a declaration of direction. To join hundreds of others who have signed the commitment, please visit thegeneration.org slash pledge. That's T-H-E-E generation.org slash pledge.